The scenario now advances three weeks to November 7, 2019, to the second meeting of the Pandemic Emergency Board. Thank you all for reconvening on short notice. Let's get an update on the pandemic. <laughs> Very short notice. Dr. Thanks, Tom. Rivers. In the last three weeks, we've seen a significant escalation of the pandemic. Previous projections appear to have been accurate. We've gone from about 35,000 cases to more than 260,000 estimated case cases with 13,000 deaths. This may be an underestimate. We know that there is a good deal of underreporting due to lack of surveillance in many parts of the world. The greatest number of reported cases are still in South America where the pandemic started, but the number of countries affected has risen from eight to 23 across the Americas, Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. We expect the spread will continue to accelerate as we have more outbreaks. We project that in one month, we could see upwards of 2 million cases and over 100,000 deaths. And in three months, there could be as many as 20 million cases and 1.6 million deaths. The markets are reacting negatively to these projections, with some markets now in the red for the year. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. All right, we want to show you the latest news on the impacts of the pandemic on trade and travel, which will be the focus of this discussion. <clears throat> In addition to global public health crisis, CAPS is creating havoc with the trade and travel industries. The frightening public health toll of CAPS continues to mount. Patients are overwhelming healthcare facilities around the world, including many of the makeshift triage and temporary care facilities. People are avoiding public spaces out of fear of infection and in compliance with public health recommendations. This has had a dramatic effect on the retail and service sectors. Businesses of all kinds are struggling to operate, let alone provide basic services as their workers have fallen sick or refused to come to work. Some companies have allowed telecommuting, but for most businesses and employees, this is not an option. Public health agencies have issued travel advisories, while some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. As a result, the travel sector is taking a huge hit. Travel bookings are down 45% and many flights have been canceled. A ripple effect is racing through the service sector. Governments that rely on travel and tourism as a large part of their economies are being hit particularly hard. Consumer confidence has fallen dramatically and people are delaying or canceling discretionary purchases. As a result, manufacturers are scaling back production on many goods. On the other hand, staples like food and medicine are being hoarded. Mandated border closures and trade restrictions are creating severe localized shortages. The Purchasing Managers Index suffered its sharpest decline in 50 years, a leading indicator that markets are preparing for a prolonged period of economic disruption. In some regions, politicians are adding to the noise and confusion through social media. Ban all goods and travel from infected countries and boycott companies that spread disease are common Twitter refrains often led by public figures. It's safe to say we face a tough dilemma. The movement of people may facilitate the spread of gaps, but interruptions to travel and trade may have economic consequences that are just as bad. And to give us more detail on these issues before <coughs> our discussion, Lucia Mullen. Caps is spreading and it's largely due to the movement of people. Individuals from affected regions traveling to unaffected areas and susceptible people traveling to affected areas and getting sick. Travel poses real health risks, both of spreading the disease and of travelers getting sick. In fact, many travelers to affected regions have gotten sick and some have died. Many countries have issued travel advisories for affected parts of South America. Additionally, politicians in a number of countries have called for bans on all travel and imports from affected countries. A few countries have actually banned all inbound travel and some trade from those countries. The total number of reported cases is currently about 30 times the total we saw with SARS and 100 times the number of MERS cases so far. And disruptions to both local and global travel and trade are commensurately greater. On the other hand, public health experts inform us that travel and trade bans and fever screens are not effective at preventing importation of a highly contagious respiratory illness. 
studies suggest that at best, they can delay importation by a few weeks. Some countries have advised against travel to countries in South America. Others are advising against traveling to any country with cases. A few countries have even put bans in place for persons or goods coming from countries with cases. These disruptions are beginning to have major economic consequences for the South American region and will soon have cascading effects globally. We are anticipating far greater disruptions to trade and travel may be on the horizon. One prominent economist estimates that global GDP could fall an additional 4% as a result of travel and trade restrictions. This would cause a severe global recession. Such a severe recession has the potential to result in both high unemployment and runaway inflation, creating the groundwork for national instability and change in the global political landscape. So the policy crisis for the board to consider in this meeting is this. How should national leaders, businesses, and international organizations balance the risk of worsening disease that would be caused by the continued movement of people around the world against the risks of profound economic consequence of travel and trade bans? So what does this board recommend? And remember, as we're thinking about this, that this pandemic is now already 10 times as large as the 2014 West Africa Ebola outbreak and growing exponentially. So your views. We've got a, a, a big dilemma. People moving, carrying disease, we can't stop trade and travel or else we risk economic consequence. Well, I think that we need to uh, evaluate the capacity of these communities that are being severely impacted in Brazil and Ecuador to assure that we don't create a humanitarian crisis there mm -hmm. and that they don't have the ability to sustain the community, which will just create more widespread panic mm -hmm. and hence more spreading of the disease. I support this way that yeah. uh, they should be maintained a basic interaction between those countries. I remember SARS at the time for us, Hong Kong was mainly affected, and we still maintained an exchange of travel, an exchange of <coughs> transporting goods, and it helped both parties. Of course, there was the risk of importing infected persons to Europe, uh, but uh, we maintained it with the uh, respective countermeasures, and it was successful at the end of the day. It was difficult, but it should be our basic philosophy to go through this as long as possible. I think, thank you for that example. I think in this case, we can be sure that if we allow trade and travel to happen, we will have continued spread. But I think for us, the, the question is, is it worth it anyway? People are going to spread the disease, but we have to keep trade and travel going in the world despite that. That's the question, or one of the questions. Steve? I, I think that th this is a, a complex question, but I think there is an analytic <coughs> approach to this that would okay. provide an answer, which is what benefit is there from those interventions that you could implement, and is there any at all? And if there's not, yeah. at least from an analytic standpoint, it's a pretty clear-cut um, decision as to what should be done. That, that doesn't make the decision, but it needs mm -hmm. to be a part of the decision-making process. And could you imagine conditions in which, for example, CDC would withdraw travel advisories? Um, if you yes. knew that they were contributing to well, I think, travel and trade I think the, chaos? The, um, I could give the ex an example from H1N1 where we had a time-limited uh, advisory um, against travel to affected areas in Mexico, and after a short period of time, it became clear that if you live in the United States, your risk of getting disease is greater in the yeah. United States than it would be from a person traveling okay. from Mexico. So that mm. that is actually very, a very helpful kind of analysis just to, to make sure okay. that you're, it's not just uh, pure harm. Chris and Jane? Yeah, I, I think we have to avoid thinking of whether this is a binary decision of whether there should be trade or travel or not. I think there has to be informed uh, travel. I think you know having advisories that let people know about what, if they are going to travel, what they need to do st to stay safe. And that has to incorporate some of the things we talked about in the last meeting about what's the likely availability of personal protection equipment or treatment should they fall ill while they're traveling. And in trade, we have to understand, again, how do we protect the people who are involved in keeping the global uh, infrastructure of trade and logistics going. We need that infrastructure mm -hmm. to move healthcare workers, to move healthcare commodities. We, 
we shouldn't take blunt instruments. We should actually protect the people engaged in making the international trading system work and inform people who are going to travel with or without a ban um, uh, and, and make sure they're making informed decisions rather than saying travel yes or no. Okay, Jane. I, I was going to make a very similar point, so let me make a slightly different one, but I agree with everything that Chris has said. We know that if you try and put a, a border between peoples who actually have reason to travel, they will go around you. And we also know that people will then hide issues around disease. So the question about how you give people the best information so they can protect themselves. And in Australia's case, in theory, we could close our borders. But let's be completely clear. Um, we probably have enough fuel supplies to last us maybe a month. So in, in a practical sense, very, very often, there's not a lot you can do but to keep trade and travel going. But exactly as Chris says, it has to be done in a nuanced way. And for those of us who traveled through Asia during SARS, I was one of those people. Being informed about what I needed to do to protect <coughs> myself was a really important part of how okay. we handled that. Thank you, Tim. So yeah, I, I think uh, in the same vein, the last two comments. First is I think uh, the International Health Regulator Regulations Committee, uh, Emergency Committee, should be issuing rational advice on how to best protect oneself, recognizing that this is this, this is already out of the bottle. But there may be ways in which uh, certain constituencies can protect themselves, um, and and those should be issued as guidance. Uh, to, to manage um, unnecessary spread or prevent uh, unnecessary risk. Secondly, um, I think it's really important for this board to be looking at one month and three months and saying, what is the essential business continuity that we have to establish now? Because this is only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at what's, um, what are the most important functions to keep not only the global economy going, but also uh, essential basic commodities to, to make sure that uh, we're not going to get into fuel and food and other critical shortages that are going to accelerate uh, economic contraction. So I think it's very important now to start projecting out to identify with the key constituencies that are responsible as mm -hmm. part of the global ecosystem for managing um, uh, life uh, uh, you know, critical um, supply, uh, uh, trade, and uh, activity to get those constituencies mobilized and begin to identify essential continuity okay. plans. We are going to actually talk about that explicitly in a bit, and uh, thank you for raising that. Latoya. Um, in looking at my sector, we know that travel is the basis, and hospitality, travel and hospitality is the basis of what we do, and limiting bans, you know, putting potential bans in, that has a wide economic effect on those particular areas. And so, uh, and devastating consequences, because we're looking at individuals who may not be able to earn a living, and it moves forward from that um, point. One thing you look at is your business continuity plan that you have as uh, a private sector industry, and see where you can uh, manipulate or even uh, look at the, the minutia of the plan to see how you can assist those areas in which they're most affected to lessen the economic strain. Thank you. If a number of people want to get in, we'll just move around the table this way. For those who haven't had a comment yet, Levon? Yeah. Um, so I've received a note to say that the supply chains are already being disrupted with <coughs> employees refusing to come to work unless they're provided with uh, PPE. So, you know, along the same lines, the business continuity plan actually kicks in already. And I would say that uh, for the rest of the business activity, so those that may not be directly impacted, they should start exercising some of those business continuity plans as well. And I think there needs to be a concerted effort by the government to get the message out. This is a good time for us to use social media as well to, to try to get people to be a little bit more calm. So the, the message needs to come across quite strongly, I believe. Getting the message out is one important thing that we really should follow up clearly also from our industry. I mean, there are so many rumors around, there are so many aspects around, and this has a very, very heavy impact, like Latoya also mentioned, for their industry. We have to keep this up. We have to try to maintain a basic service all over, otherwise the system mm -hmm. will collapse. And uh, it, it at the moment, it really faces on, on rumors and on, on aspects that are a fact that we transport affected passengers, yes, that's a fact, we cannot, cannot mm -hmm. neglect this, but uh, we should deal with this somehow and still 
still uh, travel and, and uh, maintaining the system is partial and crucial that we can have any efforts also with the outlook to the future to the next months. And travel advisories are also impacting reporters who aren't able to get to the impacted areas, so the right information is not being disseminated. Uh, a lot of the information that is going out to the public is through social media, so as we put out those travel advisories, there's a real need to make sure that the newsrooms have the right information to know when their news reporters are going to be safe, and how can we get the right information disseminated rather than hearsay on social media. Thank you. I think to Tim's point about long, <coughs> short and midterm planning, a stakeholder can community that needs to be engaged mm -hmm. is the technology and te telecommunications mm -hmm. industries. More remote work could be a possible mm -hmm. help in this instance. Excellent. Technology can be the platform, but in an increasingly mobile dependent world, we need to make certain that the telecommunications system can hold up to increased demand and pressure. Yep. Okay. And uh, I think we're concerned that the varying travel policies are going to allow corporations to apply inconsistently hmm. what those policies are, and it's just going to continue to aggravate. You mean national policies? Yes. Okay. So an international approach would be highly desirable for companies that are moving goods. Are real? Yeah. I'm, so I would absolutely agree with the comments that were made by Chris and Jane and, and Tim in terms of how we would think about this moving forward. I think. The other things that I would um, just add in to that is that it seems to me that travel bans, one of the concerns with that is also in relation to not just the economic consequences, but your ability to actually respond effectively to the health issue to begin with. So that clearly has to be a factor that should be addressed in the context of uh, you know, analyzing what the right balance is. In addition, I understand uh, my staff has told me that um, there is concern from the State Department and the White House about instability that would be essentially breaking out potentially in, in South and Central America as a consequence of this. And that's obviously another issue that we would want to factor into what would be the right balance for, for travel. But the final thing I just say is that in the United States, certainly we have experienced in the past um, political pressure to basically stop travel when there's panic in the country. And one thing that I think we learned from the Ebola crisis in particular was that stepping out early, communicating as effectively as possible with the public about what it is that you're doing, what you know, informed travel should and should not be, and so on, and, um, but also having a policy and establishing that policy early so that states and others can understand this is how we're supposed to be sort of communicating and working with uh, the federal policy on travel on these issues. And I think internationally, you might have a similar scenario in which the World Health Organization, UN, and others are saying, this is what we believe to be the best practices for travel. That can be very helpful in trying to manage what the sort of public panic might be. In that so case. you would advise a common international approach to this to the extent that that's possible, as opposed a to country by country? Coordinated is what I'd say. Coordinated, OK. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Adrian, and then we'll go to George. Just heard from my, my staff, in fact, you know, we need to differentiate between trade and travel. Because what we're seeing now is we're substituting one medical crisis for another medical crisis. We, we can't get the precursors for our drugs shipped to manufacturing plants to be able to supply other conditions, not, not just this, this outbreak. And so we need to think about what is travel. Is it non-essential travel? Is it business travel? I think we have to be clear about are all countries created equal in terms of risk? We need to have real clarity of communication around that if we're going to maintain our medical supplies globally. And for global business, for your company, where should that communication be coming from? It should be coming from respected authorities. So it should be coming from uh, uh, CDCs, WHOs, Departments of Health, and then we should promulgate those as an industry, as we already do through organizations like International SOS, uh, so that we have um, that, that risk clearly identified. So you raised the question of essential versus non-essential. I just would ask the group, what is essential trade and travel? Do we have a common definition or even a, the beginnings of a definition of what should be essential trade and travel? Well, WHO it will depend on the context. Lists. WHO, should, we should use WHO's essential, list. Essential, yeah. essential for trade medicines. and travel. Yeah. <laughs> for, for medicines and supplies or for all trade and travel? Uh, no, it's, it's just medicines. Medicines, but, uh, okay. Um, it, uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's the right question. Okay. I'm sorry, George. Yes, I've got some uh, information from my side. Uh, it looks like some countries already banned or travel, uh, travel. and um, it looks like also in China we have a few hundred uh, cases and also have a dozen death cases. But look at the data. So far, we we collected. Mm. Looks like you know, uh, think about think about the 2009 pandemic, H1N1, and also uh, Ebola. 
Of course, you know, if you can stop everything, you know, it looks like the numbers would de decrease. But you have to balance between the trade, travel, economics, and you know, uh, the, the social activity, everything together. So in my opinion, think about uh, H1N1 and uh, Ebola. Maybe risk communication and the public understanding the whole situation is more important than the ban mm -hmm. of the traveling and everything. So this is, I would agree with Matthews, you know, spread the, spread the knowledge spread the knowledge you know, to, to the public by okay. mobiles, all these you know, accessible device. Can, Thank can, you. Sophia, can did I, you want to comment on that? Yeah, Sophia I, want to agree, I want to agree with that. Okay. Um, and my staff have advised me that basically the level of support for travel restrictions is somewhere between 57 and 90%. Now, we all know politicians will be influenced by the, the general view in the community. But we can use that in a positive way. The truth of the matter is, if we find ways to retard spread and if we can work with people, so what we're doing is, one, consistent with uh, meeting their concerns, but we do it in a way that actually meets the science need. And we did this, we have done this with Ebola, we've done it with flu. So we've got history here, but we need to do it in an orderly and in science-informed way. Okay, thanks, Sophia. Thank you, and just a note that uh, the UN is now concerned that uh, the travel restriction is now impacting countries that have not even reported any cases and uh, recommends that uh, member states actually uh, follow the WHO guidance and that means not to uh, implement a travel ban. I think it goes back to the communications um, point that has been made around the table about the informed travel, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, we've reached a point in where um, travel discussions and bans, whether it's personal or commercial, is um, affecting supply chain. And, 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 and there's fear and panic about uh, ships and uh, coming into docks and, mm -hmm. um, you know, supply. So it's starting to interrupt supply chain. So we just, we, you know, we have to just be cautious at this point in the time of the crisis that it's not just about travel because now it's spreading to supply chain issues because, you know, countries or even companies are saying don't let that, you know, ship come into the dock because it's coming from an area that's, right. I think, so it, it, it's a, it, we, we, it, we can't be siloed in our thinking about, oh, it's just travel ban right now. Right. So it's starting to affect a broader part of the uh, crisis. So for those of you who work in the global supply chain, what kind of strategic interventions are going to be necessary to keep trade and travel going? Are we going to need to have government bailouts of companies, or are companies going to be able to make it through this crisis? For example, Lufthansa or others in your industry, are we going to need subsidies, liability, remediation, countermeasures? What's it going to take to keep Lufthansa flying? I mean, first of all, it is really that we have open communication, that we try to convince, as Sophia said, governments not to ban each other, especially if it's countries that are not affected. We realized it. I take again the example from, from the SARS crisis. Uh, Hong Kong was heavily affected. We had good communication with the government there, with the CDC, and we could find a way to maintain operation, although it was uh, economically a nightmare, 20% booking figures in the planes for certain periods. So you're but flying planes with 20% Bookings? Yes, but we, How we, long kept, can you we kept flying. Okay, that time it was one destination. If it's worldwide, 20% booking figures, we have to adapt the network. We will not maintain this for several mm. weeks. That's the case. But uh, that's why it's so important. And once again, with Sophia, we have to spread this out clearly. Countries that are not affected should be served on a normal basis. Countries that are affected should be served on an adapted basis, uh, what is necessary, but still should be served. And we need a clear and open communication. Jane mentioned it as well. What is essential, what is non-essential travel, we have to clarify this. Otherwise, if we go down to 20% bookings over a long period, the company will run down. That's a fact. I should just say on this chart, this is the information that we have, but I think most public health experts presume that there are cases in many more countries. So I think it would be false reassurance to say, we can keep flying to this country because there are no cases. We don't know that there are cases, but we believe that there are cases they haven't been detected yet. Huh? Yeah, Tim. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I, I, I think it's really important to have a plan uh, that identifies uh, the dozen or two dozen trade and uh, travel uh, sector players that need to get together and agree on how they're going to have a collective business continuity. And, and, and it, it, it's the sort of thing where you need the leadership of those industries to gather. And they have to come together in a, in a, in a way which perhaps is unusual, uh, but where there should be some government incentive 
to, to collectively organize and perhaps help to buffer the crisis um, with, uh, with whatever fiscal measures might do that uh, collectively to make it clear that it, the, uh, on the imperative for keeping the system moving. But I, I want to suggest that it's really important that that be done in a pluralistic way rather than a singular effort across all sectors. Because if there's some sense that there's a UN institution that can do all of this, mm -hmm. then I, I, I worry we're suffering from a delusional disorder mm -hmm. on the power of the UN. Uh, it's really important to get those industries and their trade associations and a, an efficient leadership established which is decentralized uh, but has a collective responsibility and accountability. And that mm -hmm. needs to be supported by um, the public uh, leadership. So government leaders yes. should, be, should be behind that. Yes, Latoya? I agree with that 100%. And looking at your business continuity plans and getting together with industries that subsidize what, what your company is doing and using the government as a um, alternative or another method of understanding what's going on and utilizing their leadership, have it decentralized because that way no one particular industry is getting more than the next. So that way it leaves everything even across the board. I see. So you so industry should be the travel industry should be broadly part of that we need discussion to be broadly about a part coordinating of that. international approach. Okay? Right. Yeah. I, I think we also need to think about the uh, healthcare workers who are traveling to some of these countries on a normal basis. A lot of these healthcare workers from different hospitals that are going to, to provide aid on a normal basis for different diseases. Are we now helping them understand how to take care of those patients in those countries? And how do we make sure that we're not causing panic among, among the hospitals um, and other healthcare organizations like Doctors Without Borders or various hospitals that have global efforts to ensure that they're not uh, causing panic and, and pulling their teams away from those countries that may really need them right now? Okay, and Sophia and then Chris. Or Latoya, I just want to jump utilize in? that, jump in on that. And to utilize uh, companies such as ourselves that have a vast healthcare system within our properties. So that's one thing we've done before. We have actually mobilized. We have nurses and nurse practitioners that work around the world for our company, and we can mobilize them and assist in you know, providing care. OK, Sophia? Thank you. I just wanted to get back to your point about the non-reporting. And um, in some instances, it could come down to c capability and capacities of the mm -hmm. health sector in the particular country concerned. And I think this is where uh, an organization like the United Nations can be of help by providing framework guidance that others could use and to help in the deployment of health professionals to these, those parts of the world that um, are lacking in the, uh, in the capability. But ultimately, governments have to be capable of asking for help um, and also to take action in themselves. The UN, <coughs> I agree with Tim, can be there and in a supportive capacity to coordinate, to assist, but it will run into the question of sovereignty every time. And so um, <laughs> governments need to be empowered and, and uh, capable of, of okay. helping their citizens. Thank you. Chris? Thanks, Tom. Two points I'd like to make. One is to just second the comments that Adrian and Brad made about the need for us to distinguish between travel and trade and to really begin to focus, especially given some of the projections of two and maybe 20 million cases within three months, to really define what is the critical part of the global supply chain infrastructure. We won't have the drugs if we can't move the active pharmaceutical agents from one place to another. Um, we really need to focus on what will it take to keep that global logistics infrastructure running. We've heard already that some workers are not willing to come to work because they don't, they're not confident they'll have the personal protective equipment. They need to be prioritized in mm -hmm. terms of access to the countermeasures, et cetera. And that, I, you know, I think the travel issue, I think, you know, we shouldn't use blunt instruments, have bans when bans don't work, have, make sure people are making informed decisions. If we go to two or 20 million cases, people are going to make decisions not to travel. Um, uh, and, and so we need to really focus on the, the critical infrastructure necessary to move health commodities, to move fuel to places that are going to require fuel to keep their hospitals mm -hmm. running, to keep Pl food plasma. moving. You know, there's a whole complex set of issues in a highly interdependent world on supply chains that are just in time. 
we need to think about how much flex there is in that just-in-time supply chain system and make sure it keeps running. I think it's going to take specificity and it's going to take knowledge that only the private sector has. The UN can play an important coordinating facilitation role, but the companies know where those commodities are, where they move, how to move them, and that's where a, a, a type of public-private collaboration that we have not generally had in these crises needs to be put together pretty quickly. Some very similar to what Tim was saying, I think. I hear yeah, but if I could just follow up on that, I think the compliment might be um, mobilizing the G20 finance ministers. Um, the reason the G20 got together initially was the Asian financial crisis. Um, and it may be that, um, uh, in fact, that there's a role for them to, to not only incent the private sector, but then also look what those complementary set of, pu of uh, public sector financing measures could be, which would actually lower the bar or make it much more attractive to ride this out into the future in a way that um, uh, companies are going to be able to get shareholder engagement, et cetera. Thank you. Eduardo, your, your business is moving things around the world. Yes. What's it going to take to keep it going? And, and just to underscore the point that cooperation among supply chain providers or businesses that have huge supply chains mm -hmm. can add a lot of efficiency to the whole process and be protective of healthcare workers to make sure that even the delivery systems workers are also taken care of using multimodal, right? air, land, and sea. So there could be a lot of cooperation with the Lufthansa's and the UPS's and others throughout the world to, to really consolidate trade lanes to make sure that the, uh, the commodities get to where they need to get to. Does that happen now? Or is that something that has been imagined already and worked on? Or no, I think that, that, happens, that happens today. It does. You know, there is a huge freight forwarder network. Uh, you know, we do not land UPS brown tails everywhere in the, in the world, so there are cooperations uh, among companies. So we could build trade Yes. Okay. Steve. Um, I think the statement about what would happen even in the absence of any government intervention, travel would decrease. People are not going to, they're going to know what the information is about where disease is mm -hmm. and not travel there. I think that there is an important role for government to not make a bad situation worse, mm -hmm. and that is largely going to be communicating um, valid and trusted information about where the problem is so that people can make their own decisions and that whatever guidance the government, national governments do provide is, uh, is tailored to where, what the situation actually is. I, I think there is a spectrum of interventions all the way from just saying, you know, hey, there's a disease here to uh, something that exists today. If you're pregnant, don't travel to a malarious area. I mean, that's a, there, there are travel guidances in place all the time of, of that sort. But let, let's be clear, people trust, trust less and less what comes from government. They're <coughs> actually enabling many sources of information, Google, Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, the free-to-air media yeah. networks, the ensuring that they are equipped, companies who will talk to their staff. And we know that very often these days people believe much more uh, something that will come from their company than they will believe something that comes from government. So we have to partner. Well, yeah, we, we, I just want to say that we are actually going to get explicitly into communication yeah. shortly in a subsequent discussion, so maybe you could hold that thought yeah. for one moment. But just in closing, it sounds like there is a kind of a support here at the table for developing some kind of international coordinated approach for identifying the most important trade that's happening in the world, the essential services uh, for their collaboration between business and governments. Any final comment? Last 30 seconds? I'd like to make a comment about the, the security of supply. You know, industries need to take a leading role in making sure that the, the key providers upstream of commodities for their final products that there are simple things in place, like for example, if going to a factory is a dangerous place, what are we doing in the factories to change that? Are people wearing masks? Mm -hmm. So there are probably very simple things that industries and trade associations could work on for critical commodities. Okay, well then we'll leave it there. We have to leave it there for time. Thank you all for your input. Our team again will take the board's recommendations and promulgate them widely to decision makers around the world. And this concludes this meeting. Great, and we will now take a 15 minute break and reconvene the exercise at 10.35. Thank you.